That's cool. Are you still in the the Upper East Side building? West Side, Upper West Side. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. That's dope. Wow, I'm doing okay. I'm doing good. Um, yeah, I I finished up my degree last year. Wow, and... great! Congratulations. Thank you. So that was that was a doctorate, right? It was. It was. Wow, great. <laughs> Yeah. Piled higher and deeper. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm not. I'm not exactly um, pursuing academia at the moment. Yeah. So. So you're in LA. You're doing some stand up and. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah. just working as a stand up. I actually booked an acting gig uh, for a television um, last month. And uh, I finished shooting that last, well, this past week. So that's that's a new thing. But um, yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to do show business rather than academia because, you know, I just feel like uh, trying to get a tenure track position is perhaps just as difficult as trying to make it in show business, except the pay is far worse. <laughs> right? Yes, that sums it up. <laughs> so. Yeah. So. So, so this is an acting, a role in in a show. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, great! Yes. You'll have to keep me posted. I will. I will. But yeah, I mean, um, I just wanted to catch up with you because you know I always I always enjoy talking to you, and um, you know, just wanted to see like what what your life has been like as you know as a retiree a retired professor but still you know your activism has never really stopped and you know i remember like when i was in when i was still an undergraduate at pace um years ago and i was first taking your class i think it was like uh i think it was like memoir writing and um uh -huh. you like one of the books i read your book um tales of a lavender menace and uh, I remember loving this one part in the book where you were like going from like activism to activism, like, you know, as a, as a woman to, you know, as a lesbian and then to like, and then like now, you know, disability rights, you know? And I was just like, Oh, like she really never stops. Like she always finds, a way to continue her work as an activist. So I was just wondering, like, if, if any of that has evolved into something new in recent years for you? Well, you know, I think um, when I became uh, visually disabled, mm -hmm. I really uh, could see that, you know, there were things that also could be done around, around disability rights. I think that, um, in the women's movement in particular, mm -hmm. we have always talked about what we called ableism, right. that when we talked about the body, mm -hmm. we say that, you know, people are currently able-bodied because we never, we never, none of us, none of us ever knows uh, whether we will have that as a permanent condition. And of mm -hmm. course, some people are, are born with what we would consider disabilities, mm -hmm. but most of us who are going to live, who live a long time, are going to um, get something or have something. Uh, things happen. I mean, one of the things I, I say is that I've left a lot of pieces on the road to, to liberation. Is right. one of the things I say, and one of them is I, I've 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 left a lot of my eyesight. So. <laughs> I think that I could take that that kind of sense of activism and injustice, mm -hmm. and I could uh, I could use those skills and say, okay, I can see what I can do, you know, in this in 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 this area, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, I was very surprised, you know, when I first when I got my first um, guide dog. I was really quite shocked at the number of businesses that um, just would reject me. Mm. Uh, that would just um, would just say no. I'm not going to seat you. I'm not going to let you in my taxi cab. 
Um, you can't come in here. And in particular, because I, I have an allergy to dogs, I, I have a poodle right. and I've had a couple of poodles now. Um, they don't see this dog as a, as a service animal. And that's more a problem of their vision than, <laughs> than of the way the dog is behaving. So I could see that this is a real um, issue. And I could see the really terrible social injustice. And, you know, I tried, and it's kind of interesting because I tried, you know, the, the old fashioned way to combat it when I, when I was still teaching at Pace. Um, my guide dog had surgery and he really wasn't um, able to get up and down the steps of the subway, but he was able to go to work. So I was taking cabs. And, you know, sometimes the cab drivers would go by and sometimes they wouldn't. But one day a cab driver, um, not only would he not take me, but he rolled down his window and he started calling me names. He started calling me names. He said, you know, oh, you know, you're not really disabled, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, and started calling me names. So my partner, Karen, was with me. And I was really, I was, I was really shocked. And she, she took uh, his cab number and I went to tax. I went to the taxi court and I, I filed a grievance and I called, you know, the number, I filed a complaint against him. And somehow after he had left that location, he flipped something in the cab and he went off duty. And we went down there and, and, you know, we waited and the system was so rigged against the consumer. Mm. I, I was just, I was totally shocked, you know, the disabled consumer, here I was, we took off, um, you know, I was, uh, I was working as a college professor. Right. Um, my partner was still working as an emergency room physician. Right. We went all the way down to the bottom of the city, to lower Manhattan, to taxi court. Mm -hmm. And, um, the taxi driver was able to hear what we said and we weren't able to hear what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And not unsurprisingly in this kind of rigged um, one-way system, they ruled against us. And they said he, he did nothing wrong. And I was so shocked that I said that they could believe that two people who had full-time jobs, who had never seen this man and one who couldn't see this man at all, mm -hmm. would take half a day of their life to complain against someone right. and were asking for no money in return. Right. It was as if we were making a financial claim. We just were really offended by his behavior that they would think that we would, <laughs> that we would do that. Um, it was just astonishing. It was really mm -hmm. astonishing. But... I think for people who are activists, it really, um, it really, it really makes me think that when this happens to me, there's so many people I know who who just can't even stand up for themselves, and it just hardens my will um, to have to stand up and do it. Um, I realize that that might not be the way, but we really have to have accessible transportation, of course, because people, you know, that is, that is an, a great equalizer to be able to go right. where you right. want to go, whether you're going to work or school, or you want to go see a friend. And that's one of the uh, things about disability. I mean, I've been discriminated against before, you know, as a, as a queer, mm -hmm. you know, where mm -hmm. people have called me names and they haven't thrown me out but you know they've threatened me which is a different kind of thing where they've called me you know threatening names and and sometimes uh you know people have called me a, a fag you know which is right. uh, i don't you know and i don't know if you can put that on your podcast but i yeah, think you know it's yeah. not like you're in a position to say oh no you have the wrong you have the wrong word i'm a dyke you know <laughs> how do i get into it with these crazy people um or people um, I go into a bathroom and, and they're the gender police right. and right. they, they say, you know, they say, what are you doing in the bathroom? Hmm. And, um, I say, well, what I'm doing the same thing you're doing in here. What are you doing in here? <laughs> and they want to, you know, they, uh, you know, I mean, pretty much we're doing the same thing. I can't <laughs> swear we're doing exactly the same thing, but, but 
but why is you know i try to engage them right i try to say right. but why exactly do you feel so threatened and and why exactly do you feel here i am i'm standing here and i either have a sight cane right um or i have a guide dog mm -hmm. and why is it that a blind person whether you think that person's a man or a woman why are you so threatened in a bathroom so right. so to answer your question yeah you know you can't kind of park your activism i guess you know it's just it, it's kind of there um and it is it is exhausting but if i don't do it who who will who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna do that right i mean i i when i first lost my sight and i had friends with guide dogs and their guide dogs were thrown at restaurants and they said, you can't come in here. And I didn't have a guide dog. They would leave their dog outside of the restaurant. I couldn't believe it. The dog cost between $10,000 and $70,000 oh, to train. I thought, if somebody walks off with your dog, then what are you going to do? Right. The school will never give you another dog if someone steals your dog in New York. Hmm. Um, I was, you know, gobsmacked by their uh, willingness to comply with this kind of voice of authority, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, may I say that, that often um, in these kinds of things that we all face, right, with bigotry, mm -hmm. I also mm -hmm. try to be understanding because all, generally I find that the person who is confronting me is usually a low level employee who just simply doesn't understand sure. and is frightened of being uh, reprimanded by the boss. Right. So, uh, you know, in, in that situation, I, I, I often say, well, you know, it's a guide dog. And, you know, I know uh, that there are fake dogs and people try to take their so-called service dogs into the restaurant. And that's, you know, if you're not sure, could you get your manager? You know, and I, I try to negotiate rather than um, call this person who's usually another woman right at the front desk mm -hmm. uh you know uh, tr i try not to escalate it mm -hmm. and i think that's always a kind of pacifist way to handle these encounters yes. um yes. just just in general whether you're in a, a a bathroom and you know and 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 i know that you know grace as an asian american you know this is may have happened to you as well where you know, maybe someone's calling you names and they're calling you names because they think that you're Chinese, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and it's not the time to be saying, don't call me that, I'm not, <laughs> you know, they, they're still gonna hate you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, see, you can't win that kind of argument with them, mm -hmm. these, these people who do this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, you laugh, but it's really horrible, the situation in this country. Um, and it's not that people weren't like this before, uh, but after Trump, people feel more comfortable expressing um, hatred right. uh, towards mm -hmm. other individuals and, and, mm -hmm. and pushing other people out of their way. Yeah, I think um, I think the part that you said about the pacifism is um, particularly enlightening because, you know, that's something I've been really dwelling on a lot. Because, you know, on the one hand, like, you know, I, yeah, I've read like Sarah Ahmed's book, you know, she talks about complaint as work. Are you familiar with her work by any chance? No, no. Um, I think you would love her work. She, she used to be a tenured professor in London and then she quit because when she tried to um, get somebody fired for like being abusive and it would like sexual assault grievances and stuff, the university ended up protecting that villain. And uh, she was like, well, you know, I'm a world renowned author and philosopher and I'm going to boycott working for a university. And now she's just an independent scholar. And she wrote this great book about complaint as work um, as a feminist. And um, yeah, like, you know, especially like in, in the last few years, I think with, uh, with Trump's election and, and what have you, I think there's been a lot of people who've been pushing back against activist voices. For instance, like this whole quote unquote Karen culture, right? Like there's a lot of people who would mm -hmm. film, f like video, film, f like photograph um, 
particularly women who would voice their grievances. Now, of course, there's like a, a diversity of ways of voicing one's grievance, right? Like in, in your instance, you're saying that you're mindful of these working class individuals. Oftentimes they don't know exactly what protocol is. And as you say, they are very anxious about retaining their jobs. And there's another aspect of like, well, if they're working class, they may also be undocumented, right? And if they're undocumented, then they really want to just keep their jobs and, you know, the, the stakes are even higher. So, um, yeah, like how to be mindful as we are voicing our grievances, because we have the right to do so. We have the right to claim space and, um, you know, be at these establishments to get the service that we're paying for. But at the same time, to be mindful of the fact that these people are also employees and workers and that they also have rights as employees and workers. Right. So it's like a fine balance. Right. To to say that, like, we're, we're all sharing the space together. We all have a right to be here together. And, um, you know, it's like, well, who in this in this case is, I don't know, perhaps like more educated or, you know, has has more of a understanding of like what it's like to to be on both ends of the stick so to speak but it was so interesting to me how after like centuries of oppression of women's voices when now that women finally do have a voice and now that we are voicing our grievances and our complaints there's this backlash against women's voices calling us quote-unquote Karens which is unfortunate because I know your partner's name is Karen and I met her and she is the <laughs> nicest woman ever the nicest woman ever but it's like to to you know first of all it's gendered right it's gendered you know yeah. and and to police that and then and then unfortunately there's this whole intersectionality issue right saying that like well it's mostly white women who are you know being this loud and then they get people of color into trouble and it's like okay that's like a really fine delicate balance like as as long as we're mindful of the intersectionality as you say like you know when these people are working class and they're just employees like you know you can always ask for somebody who can help you who can accommodate you right and another thing that was coming to mind when you were talking is like how anti-dog culture New York City is, you know, because in L.A., dogs are everywhere. You see dogs all over the place. I was living in Berlin for a few months and dogs are just everywhere. In Berlin, like German dogs, they're just so well trained and behaved. All, most of them are off leash and they are everywhere at every establishment and it seems to me like New York in particular is especially not so accommodating when it comes to dogs, even service animals. And, you know, I think I, I, I just that's just something I noticed. This, this, this is an interesting point. I mean, I think that um, when we talk about um, American culture, um, I lived in France for a year and mm -hmm. I didn't have a dog then, but you could take your dog anywhere. You could take, they didn't have a doggy bag in a restaurant to take your food home. If you wanted food for your dog, you brought your dog to the restaurant. That was a doggy bag. Right. If the dog didn't behave, you and the dog left. If oh, you wow. and your dog didn't behave in church, mm -hmm. uh, gen you know, generally you, you, you had to leave. Right. But most places you could go with your dog. Mm. The other thing in France, the restrooms were um, gender neutral. And this mm. was in the 1970s. This is almost mm. 50 years ago. Wow. You, women walked past the urinals and went into a stall. If a man had to go into the stall, he could go into the stall. Mm. I never heard of anything happening. The worst mm. thing of living in France was most men didn't avail themselves of the restroom, but went between cars or on the trees or, you know, it was, you know, it, it, it was ubiquitous, right? right? But this is one of the things about American culture is that we, um, we are brought up in this country uh, with phobias and restrictions. Right. Um, and a lot of it has to do I see it as, as the phobias of the straight white male, mm -hmm. uh, particularly around restrooms. Right. They, they were, you know, that in this country, 
um, you know, the, the patriarchy, the white, you know, this white patriarchy, yep. the, they're afraid of, 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 you know, people of color, so they can't come in the restroom. Right. Right. Yes. They can't go into the military. Uh -huh. um, and now there is all of this focus in this country on trans people. Right. What if they right. come into the restroom? Uh, what's going to happen in the restroom? Um, you know, because they don't, they can't focus so much anymore on African Americans the way they used to. So right. they've transferred right. a lot of their phobias that are really focused on uh, public uh, restrooms, as we call, and that's how we call them restrooms. We only call them toilets, as they do in in uh -huh. Europe. Uh -huh. All of this fear is now focused on trans people, right. and uh, as a convenient, uh, you know, victim for their fear. And because these white men cannot behave themselves in the bathroom, they can't behave themselves in the military and in other spaces, we had to have segregation in this country that we right. didn't have right. in, other, in other places. And um, it's the same thing, I hate to say it about animals. People are, I've never seen so many people uh, who are afraid of animals. When I taught at Pace and I had my first guide dog, I only taught with Woody at Pace, mm -hmm. uh, it happened almost every time I went to teach, I would get into the you know la the large elevator right. and two people usually young women would run out of the elevator and sometimes i would say to them i'd say look you're going to college in new york city there are people in the city who rape there are people in the city who are robbers there are uh, purse snatchers. There are um, all kinds of criminals in New York City. Why are you afraid of the poodle? Why, you know, <laughs> why is why are you focusing on the poodle and running? Right. I know that you can't. That that this is a you know a gut reaction, but take a deep breath and try to think about it because at some point you're going to have to face, you know, a terrible fear. Mm. You're going to have to, mm. you're going to have to face this really horrible fear. And it's going to be something worse than a poodle in an elevator. Right. You know, because sometimes right. these kids who are running out of the elevator would be in my class. And like, I tried to talk to them about it, that this was, you know, that, that, you know, nothing, was going to happen. And I know that these phobias that people have, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to be critical, but trying to suggest that there's a time in life um, when we all have to examine our own fears. Yes. And, 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 and examine, you know, and see how we can deal with them. I remember the first time after I lost my sight and I was going to the Guild for the Blind and I finally thought, well, I should just walk home. And I went to Central Park to walk home. Oh, wow. And I didn't realize it, but I could no longer see the buildings outside of Central Park. So when I went north and there was, there was a fork in the road, I didn't know where I was. Wow. And I was lost. <laughs> I always had a phobia of being lost because my father would never ask for directions. Uh. I had one of those men in my family, mm -hmm. and he would never admit that he was lost. Right. And I'd say, Dad, you're lost. And he'd say, no, I'm not lost. And I never get lost, he'd say. And I'd say, well, you were once bewildered for three days. What are you talking about? <laughs> so I really don't like getting lost. And here I was. I was in Central Park, and I started to, to stop people mm. who were going by. And uh, they didn't speak English. You know, okay. how it was, they were all tourists, no one spoke okay. English. And I said to myself, I said, look, I said, you have to face this. You have to figure out which way is north. You can right. still see the light. You have to focus on the light. You have to find something you can see, and then you'll find your way. And as soon as I, like, took some deep breaths and I figured out what it was, 
I could figure out where I was, I could make my way. Now, of course, there are apps on my phone that not only tell me where I'm going, but they tell me what stores I'm passing. You know, technology oh, yeah. has become really incredible. They'll say, oh, at 11 o'clock, there's a Starbucks and then there's a dry cleaner and so on and so on. But, you know, I really had to face this, um, this phobia of my own and say, you know, I'm lost, but I'm going to get out of here. I'm only, I'm only in Central Park and nothing, nothing's going to happen. Eventually I'll either get home or if I walk in the same direction, I'll, I'll be out of the park. This is not going to be an issue. And, and I, you know, I think that in American culture, um, I noticed that when children have this terrible phobia, say of a dog, uh, which to me is kind of the canary in the mind about people being phobic that the wrong gender's in the restroom, I noticed that the parents don't ever try to get the child to deal with it in any way. Mm. You know, that they don't, you know, if the child is screaming out of the elevator, they don't try to say, oh, the dog's in the corner, the dog isn't moving towards you. There's, you know, there's no effort to um, to get people to deal with this. And I don't know if maybe that's the current thinking. They think maybe it'll go away, but having seen enough kids in college, yeah. uh, I don't know mm -hmm. if it does on its own without some encouragement. Oh, and yeah. and that, you know, for the parents listening, I think it's a perfect time, you know, because kids are afraid of going in the water, for example. Yeah. I've seen lots of kids who are, you know, phobic about the ocean or swimming sure. pools, yeah. um, all kinds of things, thunder and lightning. Right. Uh, it's a good time to get over these things. I, I think that's so important because what you're talking about is a fear response. Fear is every is something that everybody feels. It's you know universal. All of us have fears. All of our fears are very specific. A lot of those fears are tied to trauma, early childhood trauma, oftentimes. And you know, like even in this story that you talk about when you were lost in Central Park, like you know, you felt the fear, you acknowledged it, and then you said, figure out where North is, right? Like, and you told yourself that this is something you have to face. Like, this was like a, a moment that you had with yourself, that you were confronting yourself and the fearful self in you. And this, this sort of phobia that you um, kind of inherited from your father, right? <clears throat> and uh, I think that's like an important moment that everybody needs to deal with because i don't think we have just one or two fears right like you know everybody has fears those fears are specific and it's just something we have to face like for instance when i graduated not even graduated yet but like this time last year may of last year i was in new york i was getting some photos taken by this very like well-known photographer and um, I was doing some shows and I was cat sitting for a friend. So I was just like kind of in New York for a couple of weeks, like just really enjoying myself. But um, I was also terrorized uh, with the prospect of graduating into a pandemic recession where arts and humanities uh, tenure track positions are in a more dire state than ever. I was seeing salaries offered for, you know, postdocs and fellowships and things like that. The salary was $20,000 for uh, people with PhDs. And comparing comparing this to STEM PhDs where they were getting $200,000, the, <clears throat> the underappreciation of arts and humanities doctorates was so apparent. And it was just so visible to me how our culture and our society and our world um, devalue uh, academics who have an education in arts and humanities. And it was really messing with my sense of self-worth. And it was really messing with the choice, like my, my self-perception of the choices that I made over the years. Because it's not like I'm in my 20s anymore. I'm in my 30s. I'm in my mid-30s. And, you know, like I thought that I was going to have a career in arts and humanities. And um, it was just not 
it, it was just not visible to me that that option was just not visible to me so i was actually you know this time last year i was in a state of real panic and um around like around june july i was really determining for myself i was like i can't be afraid of this i can't i cannot be afraid of my future so my goal for this year is just going to be learning to become fearless right and part of doing stand up is a huge exercise in facing that fear because to me there and a lot of people say this there's nothing scarier than going up on stage by yourself and trying to make a group of people laugh it's a very daunting thing so in a way i sort of confront my ego and my fears every single night by doing that so i'm already doing that but it's like am it's like okay you know the other the other reality i had to sort of face was like well why did i choose a phd and not an mfa you know even though i was always a creative individual why did i choose a phd and not an mfa and i thought well a phd might offer a little bit more job security than an mfa even though now that i got it i realized that's not even necessarily the case and i was like well if i was always a creative individual why did i keep hiding behind the facade of academia and scholarship you know so I was like, I'm just gonna do art, you know, as much as possible. I'm gonna write books. I'm gonna, you know, paint and draw. I'm gonna, you know, make a film. I'm gonna do this. So I, I just kind of like unleashed in terms of my creativity as fearlessly as I could. And a year goes by and I'm here now and I'm like, well, I still don't have job security. I'm doing freelance work here and there, but I'm still doing exactly the things that I wanted to do. And I feel like I really needed that period last year where I was confronted by that fear of insecurity, that the instable, unstable life that I might potentially face as an artist rather than a tenured professor. And it's like, well, you know, yeah, I, I just needed to process that and get over that. And I, honestly, I'm a lot happier than than I ever was, you know, even in my 20s when I was working a job, a full time job, I was actually quite miserable doing that. So. I think you're right. Like everybody does need to face their fears, but the problem is nobody can force anybody to do that. That's just something that they have to come to terms on their own. And, um, you know, I, I see, I see young people, you know, struggling with that, but I also see adults struggling with that grown ass people who deliberately say, this is the thing that I'm the most afraid of. And I'm going to live my life. I'm going to construct my life around this fear that I have. And I'm not going to ever change that. And there are people who self-admittedly talk about that. So yeah, I think, I think, um, uh, trying to become a whole person by facing your fears is one that takes bravery and uh, self-awareness and and self-acceptance, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think what you did, though, I think coming to a kind of closure in terms of graduating, mm -hmm. I, I think that that was a good thing because it it made you see that it was time to go down a different road. And I think that one of the things that helps people um, confront change and even to embrace it is to have a defining moment. And graduation can be one of them, for example, mm -hmm. when, when you see that now, okay, I, I'm waiting until I graduate. And then when you see you do graduate, and nothing changes, then you have to reevaluate mm -hmm. um, what you thought would happen. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that, uh, you know, for a lot of students, I, I think that things have really, have really changed. Yeah. And I, I think yeah. what you're saying has a lot of ramifications. For people who are phobic, the pandemic on one hand has allowed people who are phobic to live in their apartments or homes and never go out. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's allowed them to uh, perhaps uh, live with whatever it is they have and maybe lose whatever sco social skills, let's say, that they were forced mm -hmm. to develop. But I think a lot of people have been forced to uh, reevaluate um, their goals and their dreams and to rethink about what they want to do with their lives and how they want to live 
and where they want to live. Right. And um, but but the the thing about fear always is that we have to get out there even if we're afraid. Yes. Because uh, if we give up, then the other side is going to win. You know, they're they're out there now. You know, and and they're just taking rights away in this country. Oh, yeah. uh, left and right from all of us. And we have to you know, organize and stick together. And I think things are going to get dramatically worse in this country before they get better. I think, I think that more civil rights are going to uh, slip from all of us. And so we have to um, be courageous and try to go forward. I mean, just for example, um, I was one of the people who... <laughs> Uh, fought for choice, yes. And I think yes. the right to control your body is is an essential choice. We cannot have uh, nine people who are uh, maybe all of them, except maybe one a woman, post childbearing years, telling women what to do with their bodies in terms of reproduction. And then when you have a baby. There's going to be no food for your baby, right? We we have no baby formula, which is something that um, could have and should have been addressed the day they shut down the Abbott Lab plant, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so mm -hmm. many things in this country that are so totally screwed up that the things and people's dreams on every level are being are just totally messed up. And people have to uh, go forward and uh, maybe embrace a different dream. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was just thinking yesterday, I, I, in, in the park, I was talking to someone that think of all the parents who adopted children and now have no baby formula. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's an entire class of people, you know, for example, they have to get out there and, you know, and, and 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 demand accountability mm. and and you know in addition to racking their brains where they're going to to get formula now uh, there has to be a way that this does not happen again we're having crisis after crisis because uh, things are just not um you know there's no accountability anymore uh to the american public and things have gotten just just really bad. And whenever something happens now, they 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 turn around and they can blame the supply chain, or they try to blame, you know, the immigrants, or they try to blame you know, trans people. I mean, it's it's just, uh, you know, or it's not the guns; it's the one crazy person with the gun. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, things have gotten really a bit out of control in this country, but things aren't going to improve unless we try to hold these people accountable right. to right. to have things get better for everybody. Yeah. Even uh, when you're talking about the formula, I was also thinking like, you know, like gay couples, you know, like they need formula. I mean, um, what about women whose bodies don't reproduce milk? There are many women whose bodies yes. simply don't produce milk, you know, like I see all kinds of problems arising in terms of that. But yeah, let me like, let me ask you this then. I mean, as a lifelong activist, you know, um, like we're, I, I've always known you, like, I love taking your class when I was a student because you were hilarious. Like, that was, like, the one thing I really liked about your class. You were always very funny. You had such a great sense of humor. And, you know, like, because sometimes remaining in the activist mode, it can be exhausting, right? It can be disheartening. It could feel dark. It could feel depressing. Like, how do you balance out the light and still maintain a sense of joy about life? And, you know, like, like, yeah, how do you, how do you sort of manage that balance? I think that laughter is a really great survival tool. And I think that's worked for you as well, Grace. I mean, you know, in your life, I think that to get through difficult times, we need to laugh. Mm -hmm. And we need to find the humor in things. And 
it, you know, self-deprecation is a form of humor. I don't think that uh, the only kind of humor, of course, I despise is, um, is picking on other people. I mean, that to me is totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But to be able to laugh at a situation mm -hmm. can help you get through the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I do find disheartening today is that um, the humor itself has turned into a form of bullying very often mm. and a lot mm. of uh, you know i can't listen to a live comedy because it's really uh picking on various groups it um you know when when you go way back to someone like for example george carlin or you listen to seinfeld where they intelligently interrogated the very nature of language itself mm -hmm. and today people some of the comics and i'm not going to talk about all comics mm -hmm. they they use a lot of uh, coarse language and and just um pick on the audience which i don't like or or pick on certain groups of people mm -hmm. and hope that the audience that has self-selected to come to their shows will side with them in laughing at the other people. Mm -hmm. However, another kind of humor where we can laugh in a way at, you know, at the, the funny side sometimes of the peculiarity of um, these, you know, the current situation mm -hmm. and the silly things that we do in, um, the post pandemic world, you know, where we're, you know, where we're living in Hollywood squares, you know, a lot of the time and, uh, you know, the ways in which our life has changed and the ways in which we found new ways to find joy, you know, and we need to share that more and to laugh more to overcome what is in many ways, a kind of deep despair for many people. Mm. I mean, people are, I think, rightly despondent. People who want to travel uh, by themselves or with their partners mm -hmm. to take their children places, and they either can't do it because of COVID, and things have become so expensive that they feel mm -hmm. that they can't do it for that reason. They can't afford the gas. Mm -hmm. They can't afford the price of the amusement park. Mm -hmm. um, these are very difficult times economically, mm -hmm. and you know, and and all of these things are economic, um, and we need to, but we need to laugh, and we need to find ways to to find something to laugh at every day, mm -hmm. or we're just gonna, you know, just go down the down the tubes with this situation. Right. Yeah. I think that's I think that's really great advice. Yeah, because, you know, sometimes like uh, when we're dealing with these things, we just forget. We just forget that we're still people. We're human beings and we deserve to feel pleasure in life. And, you know, something as simple as like, you know, sharing something funny with a friend or, you know, going to a, going to a comedy show or, you know, seeing a, a good film, a funny movie or whatever, you know, like, I think it's so important to do that so that we don't end up, you know, crumbling, <laughs> right? Just breaking under the pressures of the powers that be, right? Yes, we need, we, we need more good comedy and people need to find, you know, more of the simple pleasures of things that will make them laugh. And I think that's one of the reasons why, there was such an upsurge in pet adoption because, you know, one of the things that I can say about, you know, the current guide dog I have, I, I always say about her, uh, the one I have now, Duchess, when the, when the guide dog school was handing out silly, she ran to the front of the line, you know, she oh, just, wow. so, you know, she's, she's a professional dog, but she does something really ridiculous every day. Right. Right. Um, right. You know, for example, I have, I don't know if I have the only guide dog who does this, but I do have a guide dog who has stolen things from stores, you know, and this is real, you know, and she's going to, you know, who's going to do hard time before her career is over, you know, and I've gotten to the, to the front of the cash register line and, you know, the checkout clerk says to me, do you know that your guide dog has a stuffed alligator in her mouth. And I say, you know, no, I don't know that. I, 
know, I saw on the left side, I'm totally blind on the left. I said, no, I don't know that. You know, it's like, and wow. then I reach over, I try and get it out of her mouth. And of course, it's just, it's squeaking, you know. Mm. <laughs> so I'm in the store with a guide dog. I'm trying to get her out of her mouth. And this toy is making squeaking noises where she has wow. Santa Claus in her mouth at Christmas. <laughs> Um, and I'm buying a toy at the checkout that I had no intention of purchasing. Right. Uh, right. You know, but I get, I laugh, you know, it does give totally. me a laugh. Because it's, you know, what can I mean, I, it's cute. What can I do? You know, yeah. I, she, you know, she just slightly turns her head and uh, gets it off the, you know, it's at her level and she just takes it off the display. <laughs> um, she, she was raised in a maximum security prison. I can't say they didn't teach her a few nifty <laughs> tricks, right? <laughs> and she's, that's so like clever of her too. I mean, she's, it's cute. She's being a dog, but she's like, oh, I know that, I know that my owner is blind. So she's not going to see me steal this, you know, like yes, that's so like sly yeah, of her. <laughs> she's, she's sly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, and it could be worse. I had a friend who had a guide dog, and uh, not every day, but almost every day, the dog on her walk would turn this woman around. She was totally blind, kind of like she was going to the bathroom and turn her a couple of times. And the next thing she knew, the dog had taken her in the deli. <laughs> and then she was at the counter in the deli every day. Yeah. And the guy would hand the dog a slice yep. of bologna and she'd be yelling yep. at the guy, don't give her another slice right. of bologna. Right. And then she knew the next day the dog was going to be back. Oh, the yep. dog would be back. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be worse because, you know, they she's do. not eating bologna every day in, the, in the deli. That's good. No, they really so, know. You know. I get a laugh. Yeah. I, that's my yeah. laugh, you know, and for sure. And and not everybody, you know, likes or wants a dog. There are a lot of work. Mm -hmm. People people need to, you know, uh, go to a playground and look at, mm -hmm. you know, in, in in a safe distance. You don't want to be, mm -hmm. you know, Chester the molester there for the children. <laughs> uh, you know, look at the children play. Find something yeah. that um, that you find amusing. For sure. Uh, and. Yeah we need to kind of lighten it up and it's good. You know, it's perfectly acceptable to cry. And that's the other thing. People don't think they yes. can do that. And this pandemic is worth, you know, for many people, buckets of tears, people <laughs> who've lost friends and loved ones. So yeah. emotion is okay here. For sure. I think that's great advice. Yeah. In fact, actually my, my dissertation title was crying, laughing, and I was basically equating both crying and laughing as like very similar bodily functions in that they're about tension release, you know, like <clears throat> it's like a bodily response to regain e equilibrium by releasing tension in your body. And some of the, 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 sim like the face, like in your eyes and your nose and in your throat like these these glands that open up they're similar in both crying and in laughing and so yeah i think you're absolutely mm. right emotional responses are okay and everybody should feel okay with that i think that's excellent advice yeah um, and you know people feel they should people feel they should tough it out you know that's right. one of the things i think people uh think and uh there are people um who have it worse than we have, but mm -hmm. we can equalize that to a small degree by helping out somewhere. There's mm -hmm. always something that we can do uh, mm -hmm. to to help. Uh, you can always, uh, for example, you know, in the upcoming elections, if you can't go out and canvas for candidates who will make change, you can join a, a postcard writing campaign mm -hmm. from the safety mm -hmm. of your home and just go to a to a mailbox and 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 send postcards to to you know uh, to voters who haven't voted recently and trying to remind them to get out there and do the right thing. There are always yeah. there are always things that we can do, and it's never too late to do something. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can always do something that's safe to do. Is is the feeling yes. that I yes. have.
I think that's another really sound advice because people often think, oh, activism has to be this big whole thing. Like they have to go out and they have to march and they have to blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you can, you can perform activism within your own proximity, anything that's within your reach, you know, like that's so doable. There's so many doable things that you, that one can do within their own means that doesn't take too much time. And yeah, voting is of course, absolutely important. Um, but yeah. Yes, you know, and I, I worked for uh, Biden in the last election mm. uh, from my computer. You know, I memorized a script. I called people. Mm. And I have to say, mostly people hung up on me yeah. uh, if they answered at all these days. But uh, sometimes you can change, you know, a heart, uh, mm -hmm. one heart at a time. And that's how civil rights happens. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen always at once. And um, it's interesting to, to, to dialogue with people and, you know, to try and um, to raise what issues you can. And the fact that I'm still here, I think, you know, the lesson, of the, the proof is that I've been an activist over 50 years mm -hmm. and I've been out there in, in many marches mm -hmm. at times when it really, you know, wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. And yes, things were thrown at me and mm -hmm. I was, I've even been shot at, mm -hmm. but I'm still here. And, um, I actually wasn't hurt and most people are never hurt. That's the thing. And I was talking about this the other day and I said, you know, of all the demonstrations I've been in, mm -hmm. uh, for causes, whether it's for peace or civil rights the women's movement, gay liberation, any of these marches, I have never been in one where anyone who was within the march started anything violent. Mm -hmm. I have never yeah. seen any violence by a marcher, not once mm -hmm. in all of the years um, I have been in a march. Everyone, there's a feeling of buoyancy and mm -hmm. camaraderie. Yes, people on the sidelines may call you names. And, you know, in 50 years ago, people would throw things. I don't know if they do today. But your chances are probably less than, than just walking down any street. I mean, you're just as safe. Uh, you're, you're safer in a crowd than going out yourself at night and often during the day. And I think people let the fear of doing things, uh, you know, get to them, you know, as, as, as yeah. was said, yeah. you know, the, the f never fear, you know, the only fear is fear itself. And that is really true. Yeah. So people, yeah. people don't go. And it was interesting in 2017 that the women's March had many, many first time marchers mm -hmm. and not all of them were young women and men. They were, mm -hmm. a lot of them were seniors who had never gotten out before. Wow. And I think that, um, you know, this is true now. I think with all of this um, post-COVID hatred, for example, yeah. towards yeah. Asian Americans, I think yeah. that yeah. particularly, you know, Asian people who have not gone out before, they, they, they see they really have to, they have to get out. Um, and, yeah. you know, that's part of being a good citizen as well, is getting out there and, and, and being visible and saying, no, yeah. we're not... Yeah we're not going to take this and we're going to have marches and we're going to have rallies and we're going to have self-defense demonstrations here yeah. uh, in yeah. our communities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in the Korea town in Los Angeles, which is one of the biggest K towns in, I think in the world, there were yeah. so many, there was such an upsurge of violence, especially towards Asian American elderly people in parking lots, you know, on the streets in broad daylight, um, really violent attacks. Oh, and also uh, delivery men and women were getting attacked as well. Um, and so they, the Asian Americans in LA uh, created this, um, I guess an organization and we would just walk around the neighborhood between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. with whistles, with, uh, you know, um, pepper spray, and with like vests, like flashy neon vests. And we would just walk around the neighborhood 
and just keep an eye out. Just like look at peek, like peek inside parking lots, you know, walk, make sure the delivery people get to their vehicle safely. You know, we would just keep a lookout during those three hours, just once a week. We just did it every Thursday. But um, yeah, it, it, like that was there was something really nice about that, you know. And it was like a simple thing that we could do. We weren't part of any government organization. We weren't part of like the police security effort. None of that. And you know, the LA Police Department don't really care about neighborhoods on the east side of town anyway. So um, yeah, like we just did something very small that we could do during that time. And um, yeah, it, it was it felt good to be able to do something that was like, again, within our means that was feasible and, you know, part of a community. So yeah, I, I, I appreciate that reminder very much. Yes. And then there's a, there's a very good group called Hollaback. Oh uh, yeah. That's H O L L A B A C K with an the street harassment people? point. Yeah. And yes. And they, they do um, workshops live on Facebook. Um, mm-hmm quite frequently where they teach people how to not just be a bystander. Mm. Um, If you see someone being harassed on the street for any reason, and they give safe ways to um, not, I wouldn't use the word intervene, but just to um, help other people. If you think other people are being harassed, you know, there are ways, for example, to pretend you see the person and you have a date with that person. You say, oh, hi, you know, there you are. You know, there are ways that, you know, so if the person is not perceived as being alone uh, mm-hmm. on the street, in a bus, right. uh, in, a, in a, you know, some kind of transit, mm-hmm. then the person is less likely, mm-hmm. you know, to be harassed because that kind of individual attack is easier when the victim of these attacks, whether it's because of race, gender, um, perceived sexual orientation or, or gender orientation, Mm -hmm. uh, that is usually, that usually happens to someone who is by uh, himself, herself or themselves. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you just, you know, act like, oh, you know, and, and if the person catches, well, it doesn't matter. It's the speaking up and the other person doesn't know whether or not you know this person. And if they think you're demented and you're just speaking to this person you don't know, it's yeah. all the more reason for them to leave. For sure. For sure. <laughs> right. I, so they give, I, I, they give you yeah. these kind of easy tips for um maybe be more present, Mm. you know, in a way. I mean, one of the things that's always disturbed me most over the years is the way the other people will not be present, Mm. you know, for me, you know, and and have not been present for me. Um, And I don't want not to be present for other people. You know, for example, I I went on a bus once going in in Manhattan and, and the guy across the way from me said, you don't belong on here with that dog. I'm going to throw you out the window. And he, he started saying this very loudly. He said, I'm just going to throw you, throw you you out of here. And I don't know whether he's just, you know, saying this to be loud. And I sit at the front of the bus because I can't see and I need the help of the driver to Mm -hmm. call my stop. I said to the driver, this man is threatening me. Uh, could you could you call the police? And he would he wouldn't. None of the people said anything, and it's silence that that promotes that. Hmm. Um, although I've had the opposite, where where people have said, you know, stop that, you know, leave that person alone. That's a guide dog, or you know, why are you picking on that person? And as soon as other people chime in, the harasser does stop. I mean, that's the thing to remember. They don't, the harasser doesn't turn on the other people. The harasser counts on the silence or or assumes that other people also hate this person. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason uh, is in their mind. Right. Uh, So as soon as other people speak up, it, it stops. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's an important thing to remember. Silence is enabling. Silence enables yes. abuse and harassment. And um, yeah, that's part of the reason why speaking up is so important. And, you know, of course, like me, you know, when I was still living in New York, I got sexually harassed every single day. And there was one instance when I was at Starbucks, I was just reading my book. I was reading Proust. I was reading at <laughs> the Starbucks at Astor Place. I was reading Proust. And this man kept telling me, kept telling me to suck his dick he kept saying it ah. and there was a table to my left that was a huge table all men like six men were sitting there and none of them said anything and i stood up and i went to the starbucks counter and i got like the tallest man i could find and i said that man over there is sexually harassing me and he was like i'll call the police and then he had me move to a different table. So I went back to my, where I was sitting to grab my stuff. And that's when some guy goes, you know, I think that man is still there. And I didn't say anything to him. But mm. to this day, I just wish I could have said, you were quiet this whole time. And now you suddenly feel like you're safe enough to speak up now that I went and got help on my own, right? Like, it was such a moment of like really i am really truly alone in the city despite despite the fact that that starbucks had like more than 50 people there you know and they could all hear what was going on so um yeah that you know honestly that kind of silence stuff it doesn't surprise me you know like for for me as as a woman like i still feel like that's still gonna be continue to be the case but since i as a woman do have that awareness of what that feels like yeah like i would absolutely intervene and say something or check in with the woman if i see her being assaulted or harassed for sure and i think and I, what i really like about you pointing out this hollaback and and their their movements and their workshops is like it's easily transferable to racialized attacks and and other forms of discrimination right like it's very transferable it's not just about women and harassment but it's you know discrimination and you know the, all kinds of attacks right so yeah I, I i really like that you you mentioned them yes they 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 talk about you know attacks also on men because mm. you know there are attacks on you know particularly gay men um mm. and or those attacks are on men perceived to be gay right and sometimes you know whether or not they are gay Right. Uh, or people they think are trans, whether or not they are mm -hmm. trans. Mm -hmm. And so uh, often these forms of harassment, they have, they have to do with the perception of what's going on in, in, in the mind of the, the harasser or of the attacker. It really, it, there's nothing that's going on in the behavior of the person who is being harassed. You know, that's, that's the thing that we have to remember. And the other thing is that one day, you know, the, for the audience is one day, it could be us. We're all going to be, you know, hopefully we're all going to be old. Because if you're not going to be old, the only alternative is, unfortunately, to pass away when you're, you're young. So right. we're right. all going to be elderly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you may not be... You're, you may be currently able-bodied mm -hmm. and you may mm -hmm. one day have to walk with a cane or you may be in a wheelchair and you may be on the receiving end of those people. Yes. And, you yes. know, get yourself some good karma out there and, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and speak up, uh, stare, also stare, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and, yeah. You know, and, and show people that you're looking, you know, if, if a couple appears to be having a fight in the street, man's yelling at his girlfriend, right. uh, don't look away, mm -hmm. stare. Yeah. Um, yeah. Make sure, you know, that they see that, that people are not looking away. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, I think that we need a different kind of, of attitude uh, in, in our society. We need to have more of a feeling of, uh, you know, you know, brotherhood and sisterhood towards other human beings. And I don't know, I think, you know, this is one of the sad things, I think, as part of the Trump legacy. I think that people, people 
are more out for themselves. Mm-hmm. Not only do they feel freer to say awful things, but mm-hmm. people are more, you know, Trumpsters in that sense, where they care only about themselves and only about their own welfare. And they really don't care, you know, where if they want to get somewhere in a hurry, they're on a bike, they'll go through the red light because they don't care if somebody has the light and is crossing the street and is slower than they are, Mm -hmm. you know, or uh, they don't want to carry a piece of paper to the garbage can, they'll just drop it. That kind of behavior, um, which is, you know, just, uh, about self all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think that has really incredibly proliferated uh, all across society. It, it, really, it really is sad. I think people feel angry. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the problem with anger is that they can't get back at the people who have profited yes. uh, from yes. what's going on. So they they take it out on people who they think they can take it out on people who are, you know, below them. And it's the way it works, you know? And so they're taking it out on weaker people or people they think are weaker. And exactly. And things are just very rough out there. It it, it really is hard. And, and, you know, and for all of us to deal with our fears, there's so many unhoused people now, Right. Uh, there are places I'm afraid to walk, not because I'm afraid of unhoused people, but because I, if I'm not with a dog, for example, I, I do have a sight cane, and I'm afraid I'll hit them with the cane, and they'll think I'm hitting them. Yeah. And then whether well, you know they're not going to sit there and think, oh well, here is someone who doesn't see, and yeah. she made a mistake. Their first instinct is going to be this, might be to kick me or swing right. back, you know. Right. So right. things have become very complicated because of the multitude of obstacles we've created Mm. um the rich have gotten far richer and we're all the rest of us are are in much more of a mess here yeah 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 Yeah, that's that's the bottom line but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't um still try to make things better in whatever way we can Mm -hmm. you know people don't realize if they can just spend one hour a week helping yeah. someone yeah. or helping some cause or, sta- you know, bagging food at the food pantry or just one hour helping a neighbor, that's better than no hour. Right. You know, it doesn't have to be 10 hours a week. Exactly. Exactly. Again, yeah. you know, whatever is within one's proximity and yeah. whatever is feasible to to that person. I think that's a great uh, note to end on. Thank you so much for making time, Dr. J. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. I mean, uh, you're one of my all-time favorite students, if I may tell your audience <laughs> that. And, um, you know, one of the, what if I can just say, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to teach at Pace was... Um, I really wanted to work. I was a first generation college student. My parents did not go to college. Mm -hmm. um, And um, they may have made it through high school. And my father may or may not have made it through high school. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to work with students like myself. I think that Mm. there are colleges where you just kind of wind the students up and you could be there and not be there. And I think that, that, students like you who I know you're going to be an incredible success in in comedy or whatever you want to go forward in and that's what people don't realize is it doesn't have to be one path that there are many different paths and your current path may be the most successful of all and I think that you you would have been very unhappy if you didn't at least give this one a try So I I know it's just going to be great to try. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And um, I I will have to say, you know, like Pace University's English department was an absolute perfect fit for me. It like really fit like a glove for me. You know, you and the other professors that I had were so nurturing, so available to us. And for that, like, I always have the fondest, you know, most precious, you know, love and memories for for Peso. Thank you for, um, you know, 
being a great educator. Thank you for being activists. Thank you for making time today.